Welcome back, everyone. If you could take your seats, we have uh, an hour and a half. And uh, just as a disclaimer, we realize it's very hot in the room. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's partly my fault because I live in the Middle East, so I'm not that uh, concerned. But there is an issue with air condition that is being, uh, in, uh, we, we, we have been informed about that. Uh, so bear with us. I think it's worse uh, the, for this last session. So, and I hope you don't feel that hot. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Yemizi Takiwangi. Yemizi is a biostatistician and professor of test evaluation and evidence synthesis in the Institute of Applied Health Research at the University of Birmingham. She's also the deputy director of the Institute. Yemizi is very passionate about people and culture and leads on this, on this for the Institute. She leads the National Institute of Health and Care Research Race Equity and Diversity in Careers uh, to support the, the careers of racially minoritized health and care researchers a priority area for the NIHR and many other funders in the UK. Amongst other issues, she really, uh, she's very involved on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and she leads the NIHR Midlands Patient Saf Safety Research Collaboration. Welcome, Yemizi, and uh, we're very fortunate to have you with us. Thank you much, uh, very much, Carla. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to give um, the Cochrane Lecture. It's an incredible honor, and um, even more so on the 30th anniversary of the collaboration. The significance is not lost on me, and I hope that um, for the next 45 to 50 minutes or, or thereabouts, you will get something out of this Cochrane Lecture. Birthdays are a time for celebration and also a time for reflection as well, to look back and um, maybe celebrate achievements and also then look forward to what comes next. My brief for the lecture was to um, fit in with the theme of the colloquium, but I was free to do as I please, so uh, beware. After giving it some thought, I couldn't think of a better title than the theme of the colloquium, because again, I was given free reign on the title for the lecture. Right, this is where it all goes wrong. Um, where is the clicker thingy? Oh, there it is. Yeah. I'm a bit blind as well, sorry. I have no actual um, or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. However, I have close affiliations with, a, um, with several um, areas of Cochrane, and in particular, the Cochrane Infectious Diseases Group and also the Cochrane Screening and Diagnostic Test Methods Group. And I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the NIHR. I'll speak today as a patient or a consumer and also as a review author, an editor, and also a methodologist. I hope I can be almost all things to everyone today so that you're able to take away something in this lecture. Um, warning, speaking to an audience where many of you spend or you invest your time in critiquing the work of, of others, um, I thought I should issue a warning. Announcing the 2023 colloquium, I think Ma Martin said it quite well that after 30 years of producing and advocating for the use of high quality evidence, Cochrane can look back on many significant achievements 
and now we need to look forward together. So that's the inspiration behind the theme. And Cochrane is not the only one celebrating a big birthday. Uh, the WHO celebrated 75 years of its existence this year. And, the, um, and they also seem to be thinking along the same lines. They are also thinking about looking back and then also looking forward as they gear up for the next um, set of challenges. I'm sorry I don't have a personal message from the um, Director General of the WHO, but his words here about the 75th anniversary of the WHO also resonates with the message in, um, on the slide with Martin earlier. We have much to be proud of, but there's still much work to do as well. Our vision also aligns with the WHO's vision of the highest attainable standard of health for all people. We continue to face vast inequities and we kicked off the first plenary thinking about global equity. There is no doubt that we can only meet global challenges with global cooperation. And global cooperation is something that Cochrane certainly knows something about, just looking at all of us here today. We have also enthusiastically welcomed the change in the name of Cochrane from Cochrane back to Cochrane collaboration. Before we consider the current landscape and hear my take on the theme, let's just spend a few minutes to remind ourselves of why we do what we do. That will also give me a chance to wipe off the sweat, so if anyone can help me with, a, with some tissue, that will be gladly appreciated. Because I've got the spotlight, I can't even see you very well so, as well. The Cochrane logo tells a story, and for me, it's also a personal story, but I'll let you listen to three people first and then I'll add my story to that. My name is Ben Arndt. I was born in 1964, and five days after my birth, I developed a severe form of, uh, of eczema, and I had it ever since. I was fortunate that the authors, they involved me from the beginning at the protocol stage, because at the protocol stage you also have to select which outcomes you want to know, which, which outcomes are important to patients. I think it was especially interesting to um, do the implications for practice, because we know how it is, how we are treated in clinical practice. When we submitted it for peer review, one of the uh, reviewers uh, made a comment and said, uh, I particularly like that section in the implications for practice. Was this written by the consumer? And yes, it was. I wrote mainly that part. And he noticed that because it was so patient-oriented. I think that the PLS, the plain language summary, is the fortune for lay people that need a reliable information. I was uh, diagnosed when I was 36 years old with breast cancer. It was in the year 1982. The surgeon, when I was diagnosed, he wanted to remove my breast. And he said to me that the only way that we can treat you, we cannot treat you other way. There is, that does not exist any other way. And I, with my common sense, I couldn't get it that I have only one option. And then I read a paper 
which one of the breast cancer review group sent to me that they could heal me without cutting my breast, only by removing the tumor and getting chemotherapy and radiation. And I had the operation, the surgery that I chose, and it was the first time in this hospital that they made this kind of uh, operation. It's called the lumpectomy. It helps me to help myself and to help many, many, especially women with breast cancer. The Cochrane Library gives you a reliable information, gives you an up-to-date information, which makes you a in more intelligent and more involved patient. George David Salby. Mm -hmm. I'm 10 years old. I like playing on my swing, mm -hmm. playing Minecraft, building Lego, and talking to my teddies. So basically, at 32 weeks pregnant, out of absolute nowhere, George just decided he was he was coming. Mm. And it just went pretty fast from there. Well, when I gave Becca two lots of steroids, it said obviously George's lungs won't be as developed as he should be. I think fighting chance is what they said. To give him a fighting chance, we need to give him these steroids. It was very very scary. I was basically just reading um, and I spotted the symbol and then there was just a little explanation underneath about it's funny that they use this symbol because and then it was about all the trials and things and then I was like oh my goodness that that's what George had and then I did some more research into it fact checked it and then I found all about Cochrane and I was like wow yeah this definitely resonates with me. Daddy's had a tattoo, hasn't he? <laughs> with the evidence on it, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the circle is you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There are scientists there working away behind the scenes and they are making a difference. It definitely, it makes me feel really good to know not only that he had the treatment, but why he had the treatment, how he had the treatment and how that treatment almost wasn't a treatment. So yeah. definitely, yeah, it makes me feel really grateful that that stuff does exist. I'm very, very lucky to have George with us um, and say it's when when we found obviously it, it is a tricky start to life for him. We found out the other children within the special care units in the in the ward that George was in didn't make it and we're just blessed. I think of hope. No, oh, bless you. Why hope? Because it gives me hope for the future that comes. Amazing stories. So like George, my second daughter, Mary, who you see here, was born premature. And I have her permission to share her story because I don't do anything without asking for permission from her first. So two weeks before she was born, I had contractions while I was at work. And I then spent a night in hospital. And while in hospital, I was given corticosteroids and discharged in the morning. I went back to the hospital two weeks later, thinking I was going to get the all clear. But I was told by the consultant that, sorry, you can't go home. You've got to have an emergency cesarean in the morning. I just had an ultrasound scan. And they found that I had placenta abruption, which is the detachment of the placenta from the uterus. So Mary was born two months early, 
and she was born with strong lungs, as you can guess, seeing as the treatment is effective, and she did not have any need for a ventilator. She'll be 22 next week. And at the time, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in Cochrane, so I, I didn't really know the story. So imagine my delight then and um, appreciation for the work of Cochrane when I later got involved and discovered the significance of our logo and this particular piece of evidence. But don't be fooled. Don't let this connection make you think that I'm just simply a Cochrane enthusiast. I am also a critical friend of Cochrane. So where are we now? I came across this on the IMF website. It's, and it's an interesting read about life post-COVID. And I'm just going to read out what um, one of the people that was asked to comment said. He used to work for the British government. He's a research professor at King's College and is also an author of the book, A World Without Work. So, as time has passed, it has also become clear that much of what is most distressing about this crisis is not new at all. Striking variations in COVID-19 infections and outcomes appear to reflect existing economic inequalities. Remarkable mismatches between the social value of what key workers do and the low wages they receive follow from the familial fa failure of the market to value adequately what really matters. The happy embrace of disinformation and misinformation about the virus was to be expected given that we had a decade of rising populism and declining faith in experts. And the absence of a properly coordinated international response ought to have come as no surprise given the celebration of my country first. The crisis then is a revelation in a far more literal sense. It is focusing our collective attention on the many injustices and weaknesses that already exist in how we live together. If people were blind to these faults before, it is not hard to see them now. Another thing that we've been talking about here and also outside of Cochrane in, in the wider world is around artificial intelligence. It's now high on many agendas and has popped up in several sessions here. Are you a tech pessimist who believes AI is a threat to humanity? Or are you a tech optimist who believes AI is humanity's greatest ally? Cochrane is not tech shy. Remember Project Transform and the many various tech things we do. And I suspect that many of us sit somewhere on, on a spectrum between these two extremes. Artificial intelligence is not new. It's been around for many decades. Those of you who know me know that I've had, well, I, I'm on my third career now. At some point in my life, I was an analyst programmer. So AI yeah, was around then as well. However, the recent proliferation of generative AI tools like ChatGPT has opened up uh, new possibilities and concerns and generated a debate on whether AI poses an existential threat. The WHO is enthusiastic about the appropriate use of technologies, but they are calling for caution as well. And you can look up the WHO guidance using um, the QR code on, on the screen if you want to find out what the six core principles are that have been identified by the WHO. Now, shifting attention to Cochrane, this comprehensive infographic, which you may not see very well, the, the only point of putting it up is to demonstrate the complexity of Cochrane. And you can take a closer look at it on the um, Cochrane website. Cochrane is a trusted brand in the world of evidence synthesis, but Cochrane is changing. We're also in the process of developing a new organizational strategy to guide us through the opportunities and challenges of the next five years. Change can come from within but most of the change that we're going through right now has been dictated externally, particularly with the key loss of key funding from the NIHR. There's immense upset and uncertainty 
but we can't turn back the clock. So maybe this is just an opportunity for us then to reset, innovate, and grow. Here are two global brand, brands. What have they got in common? I'll just let you have a think. As certain as I can be, seeing as I'm a statistician and my job is always about quantifying uncertainty, I think there's a good chance that you've had one or more of these um, products of these um, brands. But what you may not know is that both of them came close to bankruptcy, and that's what they have in common. It's hard to believe that Apple, which is the first company to hit $3 trillion, was on the brink of bankruptcy in the 1990s, about the same time as Cochrane was in its early years. Apple was saved by Microsoft, but they had to change and innovate, and the rest is history. Lego, the world's largest toy brand by revenue, they went back to basics, and they put the consumer first with its user-led strategy. Does that sound a bit like Cochrane? Cochrane is not going to get a savior like Microsoft. We are going to have to save ourselves, or at least that's how it looks to me at the moment. And importantly as well, too, we have to continue doing what it is that we do best without compromising our values. So what are the values of the Cochrane collaboration? I couldn't find it online was not on the Cochrane website. So who else do you ask when you don't know what to do? It's no longer Google. Ask ChatGPT. So ChatGPT returned this. Cochrane is an international organization dedicated to producing high quality systematic reviews and evidence-based research to inform healthcare decisions. Cochrane's values reflect its commitment to rigorous research, impartiality, and improving healthcare outcomes. As of my last knowledge update in September 2021, Cochrane's core values include, and then it gave a list of eight things, but having looked on the Cochrane website, I figured out those were the 10 core principles of Cochrane. And then ChatGPT finished with, please note that Cochrane's values may evolve over time, and it's always a good idea to refer to their official website or publications for the most up-to-date information on their values and principles. So, without um, any help from ChatGPT, and also considering the theme of Forward Together for Trusted Evidence in the context of the global challenges that I briefly outlined, the fact that Cochrane is changing, and also our future focus, I got thinking and I came up with the image that forms the structure for the rest of this lecture. I could have titled this slide, The Five Pillars of Cochrane, which may suggest that I'm about to propose a new set of values or maybe even a Cochrane religion. But no disrespect to any faith, including my Christian faith as well, that is not what I'm doing. I'm just trying to visualize, is the way my mind works, I'm sorry. So this is what I've come up with. The five pillars are simply part of a structural metaphor where collaboration is the foundation on which the pillars of relevance, equity, integrity, transparency, and rigor are carefully balanced to support the continued production and dissemination of trusted evidence. The resilience of this entire structure is dependent on the strong foundation of collaboration and then supported by each of these essential pillars. The pillars are not independent, but they're interlinked, providing additional strength to the structure. I'm sorry my creative efforts do not extend to 3D, I could only manage 2D. From what I've heard during the colloquium, which made me even wonder if someone had hacked into my laptop, but I, pro I promise you I am not paranoid, I did wonder whether um, it was just a case that I had um, adequately reflected on the theme and also the different strands. 
that went on during the colloquium. Right at the start, in the first plenary, Catherine announced we were reverting back to being known as the Cochrane Collaboration, so I was quite pleased that at least I'd put the foundation of collaboration on there. And then Karen, in that same plenary, she talked about disinformation and misinformation and a landscape similar to what I have just described. Jimmy provided a historical context of racial bias when he was talking about global equity, and I was thinking, please, please don't use any of the examples that I plan to use in my talk. But mine are going to be contemporary examples. Gary used a metaphor of three pillars, two of which you see here, research integrity and transparency. And then on day two, speakers talked about research integrity. And finally, this morning, we heard about co-production, which you also heard about in the video earlier. As part of the 75th anniversary of the WHO, and I really recommend you having a look at this, they published a timeline of milestone achievements as a reminder of some of the most memorable successes and how these have contributed to improved health across the world. In 2010, WHO recommended expert MTB reef assay, which was a paradigm shift in the diagnosis of tuberculosis and drug-resistant TB. Since diagnostics is what I know best, I don't know very much, but I do know something about diagnostics, I'll use this um, assay often as I unpack the structure, beginning with collaboration, the five pillars, and finally trusted evidence. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, TB was the top infectious killer with about 4,000 deaths daily, yet it is preventable and it's curable. This lecture wouldn't be complete without mentioning Sir Ian Chalmers. He gave the first Cochrane lecture in 2013 when we celebrated Cochrane's 20th anniversary. And I really recommend you having a look at that lecture online. Wonderful session yesterday in the 30 years of the collaboration session. And it was great to see so many people who were there at the start as well. I enjoyed reading about the first cohort of Cochrane Emeritus and Lifetime members, but I singled out Hal Williams because of the things that he said in the piece, which again talks about collaboration. So Hal wrote, how did I get involved with Cochrane? Simple, it was Sir Ian Chalmers. My personal highlights are working together with people from all over the world, no hierarchy. Also working with patient contributors like Maxine Witten, who ended up leading the Cochrane Review on vitiligo, a condition associated with loss of pigmentation that can affect people with dark skin prof profoundly. Our internal editorial team was a joy to work with, really committed people who were key in producing high quality reviews. We had a real sense of an international community in Cochrane, and we were all in it together. We had an excellent team of editors committed to the principles of EBM. Our old motto was, the truth is out there. I also learned a lot from the colloquia, fantastic workshops from people like David Moore, Barney Reeves, and Jonathan Stern. It also gave me a lot of satisfaction to hand over the coordinating editorial role after 21 years to Bob Doyle from Imperial and Robert Delavelle from Denver. Both loyal, fair, and knowledgeable systematic reviewers with great organizational and people skills. How did I get involved with Cochrane? First, Alex Sutton, whose infectious enthusiasm for evidence synthesis led me to undertaking my MSc dissertation with him on updating systematic reviews using a cohort of Cochrane reviews. Then second with John Dix, when I went to work with him on the introduction of DTA reviews into the Cochrane Library, which was a project funded by the NIHR. John has been a great mentor, and even though he says that I am now his boss, it is merely a technicality, even though, yes, he does listen to me when I tell him off. 
My first colloquium was in Freiburg, and I've been fortunate to attend each one since then, often running multiple workshops to build capacity in Cochrane DTA reviews. And that's how I met Dr. Karen Steingart in 2013. Cochrane is full of unsung heroes. One example is Karen Steingart, who was recognized at the AGM on Monday as a Cochrane Lifetime member. Karen became active with the CIDG in 2011, leading a Cochrane DTA review of expert MTB for TB. We wrote in her nomination, Karen has been the most meticulous and at the same time author-friendly peer reviewer, colleague and editor you could wish for. Her generosity of spirit and fostering of collaboration between people and institutions in completion of high impact, timely Cochrane reviews means she truly epitomizes the Cochrane collaboration. Karen has a personal interest in mentoring junior investigators, especially researchers for low and middle income countries, and this is evident in the Cochrane review teams that she has assembled over the years. She's also strongly committed to mentoring and helping women develop careers in science. As such, she's been able to pass on the baton to me to ensure the important work of producing evidence reviews for the WHO Global TB program continues. She has loved being part of the collaboration so much that in an email she wrote, sigh, am I really retiring? Karen lives in Oregon in the US, and when she got the news about the award on Saturday, she was on the Oregon coast with her grandchildren, and I included in my message the nomination that we had submitted for her, which she read out to her family, and they all burst into applause. And that, to me, is really what collaboration is all about. Cochrane is truly first about people. So, in a change in Cochrane, how do we ensure that we remain true to the amazing spirit of collaboration? If only we could bottle this spirit, we would knock Apple off the top and we will become the most valuable company on earth. Now I'll talk about the pillars. Cochrane's focus was traditionally on reviews of randomized controlled trials of intervention, especially peer-wise comparisons. Then along came the others. The steering group, um, group approved the introduction of diagnostic reviews into the Cochrane Library in 2003. And then there was a meeting in Freiburg where methodologists got together, and that was a pivotal moment for the um, for the work that then led to the introduction of the reviews in the library. And you may recognize some of the people in the photo, including Petra McCaskill, who was recognized as an emeritus uh, member joining that elite group again at the AGM. We now have lots of different types of reviews, and Cochrane has been very um, adventurous. Karen and her team, they've authored over 10 CIDG reviews, and these reviews are not only just diagnostic accuracy reviews, they include an, um, qualitative evidence synthesis as well, and um, a, a review of impact on patient outcomes. Every year they do a special collection which is uh, published to coincide with World TB Day, again, just putting the evidence on the agenda. We've talked about AI, and we may think that AI is far off, but we already have a protocol for AI. And I'm really looking forward to reading this review because I do have that condition. So, we have new opportunities. But are we going to be able to live up to them? Do we have the capacity, the capability, and the consistency to deliver? The second pillar is on equity. We have a new review format, and we've added sections on equity. I thought the whole point of this format was to simplify the review. 
So I wasn't really, really keen on all these new headings. Particularly when I remember my favorite quote from um, a peer reviewer. So he said, thanks for the feedback on this Cochrane review. The topic is highly relevant. However, my main concern is that the authors use 50 pages of text to summarize two studies. This does not look very efficient, and some users may prefer to read the two original studies, which in any case were of relatively poor quality. So we do have quite a reputation for making long reviews. To my credit, I did not complain to anyone. Instead, I thought I'll try and figure it out myself. So we're not the first thinking about embedding EDI in our reviews. The NIHR now, it's mandatory when you submit publications to include a section on EDI. My first observation about reporting on, um, when thinking about what other areas can we look at besides just always thinking about maybe subgroup analysis, the populations, and so on, reminded me of a review that I was involved in with the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, EGFR, and Race Equity Task Force. The use of this so-called black race modifier in calculations has been he heavily debated, and that was the motivation for the review of the evidence. But we weren't alone. There were other people as well who were looking to address this. And at the end of all the, the reviews, the National Kidney Foundation, the ASN, NICE as well in the UK, as well as another joint um, task force, all decided to remove these recommendations and, and um, instead have race-free um, equations. Another example is, uh, is, and this is a very recent review that's been published where they have looked at tests and assessments that indicate the health of newborns. And they found that they are limited and not fit for purpose for black, Asian, and minority ethnic babies and need immediate revision. The chief executive of the NHS Race and Health Observatory said, we need to address the limitations in visual examinations of newborns, such as APGAS ab ab scores, where the assessment of skin color can potentially disadvantage black, Asian, and ethnic minority babies with darker skin. The results from this initial review highlight the bias that can be inherent in healthcare interventions and assessments and lead to inaccurate assessments, late diagnosis, and poor outcomes for diverse communities. That's what the APGAS score looks like. It's a simple and useful score, but at the same time, it has that bias. And even, there's this one about the, the color of the baby's skin, pink all over. A black baby that is pink all over, something is seriously wrong. <laughs> so that's one thing that we can look at as Cochrane, looking at those tools. Is that something that methods groups can look at as well as when we look at our reviews, how we shout out some of these tools that are being used in clinical trials. In one of our reviews of um, TB, rather than doing um, subgroups of children in reviews of adults, we decided to have separate reviews for children just because children had been ignored in TB research for far too long. Also, there are additional considerations as well. So don't just always think of subgroups, but different ways that we can address equity in our reviews. So when it comes to embedding inclusion, is Cochrane truly ready and ambitious enough? Are we trained enough? Are people culturally sensitive enough, particularly when we take a global perspective? How are we going to peer review all of these new sections in the reviews? My third and fourth pillar is about integrity and transparency. There was a robust session yesterday, and as Lisa said, the focus has been mainly on interventions, randomized control trials of interventions. Because of the issues around evaluations of tests during the pandemic, the Royal Society, uh, Royal Statistical Society, 
convinced six statisticians to look at the statistical evidence that is needed to reassure um, the public, decision makers, and clinicians, and, and, and the general public. As part of that, we came up with recommendations in three categories, looking at study design, um, transparency, and regulation. And these are our set of um, recommendations for transparency. We still have a long way to go, and we don't think this is perfect, but it was just a quick response to what was going on when people were doing practically anything. Um, this is an example of a test that we included in that report, and it's an interesting one because it was one that they were rushing to evaluate. The, the manufacturer said this was very sensitive, very specific. They even quoted um, a rigorous, independent, um, extensive validation study, which was a preprint, and in it, it, it talks about um, the type of reference standard, which they said was a pseudo-reference pseudo standard, gold standard, which is a new one for me. They probably hadn't looked up the meaning of the word pseudo, which could be sham or bogus. But by the time they got to the second version of the preprint, they had um, changed that. And one of the interesting things, too, in that first preprint was that even just looking at the methods and the results, the numbers don't match up. And then the numbers changed again in the next preprint, and then in the published paper as well. So there was a, a study by uh, Public Health England that showed that actually this test was less sensitive and less uh, specific, which then meant that even though we had committed to buying millions of the test, um, the government had to pull the plug. So in Cochrane, are we, com we are committed to integrity and, um, and transparency, but where do we draw the line? Rigor, the final pillar, responsible methodological excellence, and this is where I'm going to have a go at methodologists. Thankfully, I'm one of them, and if you decide to exclude me from the community, I've been told that I have potentially a career in management. So what I want to encourage us is around co-production. And I'm using this example of when Cochrane convened a group of us to look at updating systematic reviews. And they brought together people, um, guideline developers, clinicians, information specialists, IT, a whole bunch of people for us to think about this together. And this work then led to a BMJ paper and also informed changes in updating in Cochrane. So my plea really to the methodologist community is let us co-produce with the people who are actually going to use the methods so that we do methods research that is relevant, appropriate, and usable. Let's not continue doing checklists for checklists, but actually do research that matters. Again, beyond the intervention question, we now have handbooks coming through, and we had this session, I think, Monday or Tuesday. We you wait for one handbook for 20 years, and then two follow almost um, immediately as well. So the other two in preparation, hopefully published in the next year or two. So we are making advances and also helping not just Cochrane to do methodologically rigorous research, but the rest of the evidence synthesis community. So, how do we balance rigor and complexity? So I'm not saying let's not do complex methods, but let's do them when they are really needed, rather than just for us to say, yeah, we can do it all, we've got this project all for papers. And trusted evidence. So for this, I'm going to read a testimonial which is from someone who used to be work in the um, Global TB program. So we asked in 2021 for a testimonial about the impact of Cochrane DTA reviews on the WHO's decision to recommend the use of rapid molecular tests, in particular the expert test. And this is the response for doc from Dr. Chris Gilpin. Over the last decade, there has been a dramatic shift in the way laboratories are able to diagnose patients with tuberculosis. 
Cochrane diagnostic test accuracy reviews have allowed the evidence for the performance of rapid molecular tests for both the diagnosis of TB and the detection of drug resistance to be collected across multiple settings with varying prevalence of TB disease, different rates of drug resistance, and so on. During this period, I had the opportunity to lead the TB diagnostic policy development process in the global TB program, and the Cochrane reviews provided robust and reliable evidence to allow WHO to develop global guidance. WHO guidelines for the use of the expert um, MTB reef and expert ultra as the initial diagnostic test instead of microscopy and culture have allowed rapid and reliable TB diagnostic testing to be decentralized and allow patients to be diagnosed quickly with earlier initiation of appropriate treatment in many low and middle income countries. The Cochrane reviews have allowed WHO to develop guidelines for Lyme probe assays that are used for the early detection of drug resistance and a simple urine, now I can't say this, we call it, I think the shortened form is LAM, so, that can reduce mortality from TB among seriously ill persons living with HIV. The accuracy reviews have stood the test of time and have, shown, and have been shown to be reliable measures of the performance of different tests. Subsequent reviews of the same or similar test have reinforced the findings of earlier reviews and allowed WHO to strengthen its recommendations for certain tests. The Cochrane Diagnostic Accuracy Reviews that have informed WHO policy guidelines for TB diagnosis remain an integral part of my new role as the Global Laboratory Coordination for the International Organization for Migration. So I'm going to leave you with the image. If you're not a visual person and you prefer an acronym, as trialists do, I have two options for you. One is try it. Someone who tries to make an effort, and this is very true of Cochrane. Or Terry. So Terry is a gender neutral name and is associated with positive qualities such as strength, kindness, and perseverance. Qualities so true of Cochrane. Many of you have shown me kindness by encouraging me that I'll be fine and thank you, I am still standing on the stage. And that you were looking forward to the talk. I even heard from Sir Mew Gray, which was a very unexpected um, but welcome surprise. So thank you all. Thank you for listening and to everyone who has made and continues to make the Cochrane Collaboration who we are. Whether an active contributor, staff past and present, critical friend, or just simply cheering from the sidelines. Thank you all. Can I keep the fan? <laughs> she wants to share. This is collaboration. Indeed. <laughs> so now we have uh, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much, MZ, for your thought provoking presentation. Uh, while we start, if people want to ask questions, I want to ask you what would be your recommendation for, for Cochrane to take the, the, the pillars and move forward in this time of change? So I don't like to dictate, and those were just suggestions. So I'd just like us to reflect and think about what our core values are, because as an organization and an organization of this size, we have a vision, we have a mission, we have goals, but goals should align with values. And so I think we're missing that bit of having values at the moment. Or maybe it's just me, I'm a bit obsessed about values at the moment because I've had to write two organizational strategies this year. So previously I wouldn't have thought about values, but I think for me now, knowing the value of, values of Cochrane, and what Cochrane expects of me because of that, those values I would quite value. Thank you. 
So we have two ways, at this point you pro probably know, but you have two ways to put your questions. You can add it to the, to, to the app, and I have the, the iPad with me, or you can ask, and there is one question already over there. So please just uh, identify uh, yourself and, and, and ask the question. Thank you. Hello, it's, I'm Rachel Plachinski. I'm a member of the Consumer Executive. And it's not really a question, it's just to say the Consumer Executive has been banging on about, about values for a couple of years and, and Jack here has done quite a lot of work. So you miss it. if you want to see what he's done and what, what we've been talking about, we'd love to have your input on that. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Just to say really it was co-designing the co-design process for how we should co-create the values. So simple, really. <laughs> thank you. Any other question for you, Mizzy? Okay. I have stunned the audience into silence. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I was struck by the description of that. APGAR scores for babies and the fact that something that has been around for as long as the APGAR score still refers to something like a baby should be pink all over. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, in your opinion, what other kinds of similar um, obvious, you know, elements of blindness exist in healthcare that we should be addressing immediately? Yes, I, I guess it's that thing of trying to Again, going back to, you know, like Jimmy's talk on Monday and thinking about the origin of some of these things and also the fact that people think that race, ethnicity is um, their biological constructs when in fact they are social constructs. And like take the EGFR, um, that equation, for example, it's binary, black or not black. Now, even amongst black people, we are not the same. And then where do you put people who have a mixed heritage and so on? So I think, especially, and I'm putting this to our colleagues in the prognosis methods group, that when developing models and the type of variables that people look at, just stop and think and question, is this something that has a genuine biological underpinning, a gene <coughs> genetic explanation, or is it just something that we think is a proxy for something else, but in itself, it's, it doesn't really have any scientific basis? And also, just put that um, equity lens on it, and I'm staring at Vivian, so yeah. Thank you. While you consider your question, there is a question that came on the app. How can Cochrane shape core values in a context of an internationally and culturally diverse organization? Should we perhaps embrace diversity in values? Oh, absolutely. And I think most organizations now, everybody is writing an EGI strategy. It's this, there's so much. I, and I think maybe some of this is in the wake of um, the Black Lives Matter, as well as some of the inequalities that really were very obvious during the pandemic. So certainly embracing diversity. And when I talk about diversity, I don't have an ax to grind. So I'm a woman, I'm black, I've got the intersectionality, but it's just good practice. It's just best practice, really. And when you talk about diversity, don't just think, is it color, is it ability, is it um, sexuality, whatever. Also, let's think about underrepresented professions and, and so many different ways that we are diverse and just embrace that diversity rather than always thinking about maybe protected characteristics, but think more broadly beyond the, the usual factors that we think about. So certainly I would vote for diversity, but I'm not thinking race when I think diversity. Thank you very much. Keep coming with your questions. I, re I realize that is hot and there is another question, but let's go to the audience first. Okay. Um, I'm Vivian Welch from the Equity Methods Group and uh, Campbell and Yemisi, thank you for your talk. It was very inspiring. Is Mir Gray here? Is he? No, because 
I went. To, uh, I went. I was had really good fortune to go to a session with uh, that Mir Gray was presenting in, and I thought his message was actually relevant to all all of Cochrane. And what he was arguing is we started with looking at effectiveness and efficiency, and maybe now in the 21st century we should be looking at value in health systems. And um, he defined uh, value, personal value, uh, allocative, technical, and uh, social value. Um, and social being the contribution of healthcare to, to social connectedness and participation. And um, maybe just be provocative and ask you both, maybe think about how, how could this change how we do Cochrane reviews? Sorry, could you? Sorry, could you repeat the last bit of the... Yeah, but, um, social value is part of values, and I think that's the essence of your value statement. I think you're absolutely right, we need one. And, um, and also that it should be co-designed. Um, and and how, when we're thinking as we do a Cochrane review, we think about effectiveness and we have uh, you know outcomes and how effective things are. But if we are thinking about value, how could that change how we, how we do Cochrane reviews or how we interpret them um, to think about what Mir Gray called social value, the contribution of healthcare to um, participation, social connectedness? Yes, yeah, so certainly something um, to think about, but I don't have expertise sort of in the value-based healthcare, so I wouldn't like to comment on something that is not a strength, but I do um, appreciate what, uh, what he said. I couldn't go to that workshop, but he shared the abstract with me, which I thought was um, thought-provoking, and some of that, those ideas came through from one of um, Archie Cochrane's um, writings as well. Thank you. I'm gonna take one from the app now. Uh, who was engaging, engaged in forming the five pillars? And where do we see the role of youth in the future of Cochrane? So those were just me, my musings. That's just me putting things together of what I wanted to share with you that I felt resonated with the theme of the um, colloquium. I wasn't proposing them as values at all, but I was just thinking about them that even though we may not have already identified or outlined what our values are. To some extent, we're already doing all of those things. It's just that we don't have somewhere where we say these are our values. But interestingly, when I was searching for Cochrane's values, there was a job, Cochrane job advert that I saw, and in it there were four values in that job advert, but I couldn't find it again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know whether there is there are values lurking around somewhere within Cochrane that made it into a job description, but um, I just have no idea. So the message is loud and clear. Not only we have to have values, but we have to communicate them well. <laughs> and then Thank what you. was the second bit of that? Uh, it's it's what's the, how do you, where do you see the place of youth? Oh, absolutely, because I'm not planning on hanging around in Cochrane for the next 30 years. So we do need to bring up, you know, the next generation. And that's why, why I was talking about Karen, that she was bringing all these teams together. A lot of those people that she started with 10 years ago, they are now, well, professors like me or associate professors, assistants. And now that we're working on the next update of those reviews for the WHO guideline next year, we've reached out to those people who are now more senior and asking them, bring on board your postdoc or a clinician. And it's that thinking about legacy planning. You don't wait till you're about to retire before you think who's going to step in my shoes, but starting to bring people in, encourage their contribution. And that's again how we'll improve diversity as well too, because we're bringing in people from different parts of the world. So the WHO said to me they've been trying to get a review team in India. So when an India, a team from India approached the CIDG, they wanted to do a review, I said I was very happy to mentor them. And I'm delighted that the lead of that review team is here at Cochrane. He helped in a workshop yesterday and he presented in an oral session this afternoon. So that's how we encourage particip participation and build up the next generation as well. Thank you very much. The Questions are popping in, but I'm going to go to the audience now. Thanks, EMC. Oh. Amy Grove, University yes. of Warwick. You've just stole my thunder on my question. I wanted to know, as successful as you are, what is the best way we can sort of foster and encourage and develop capacity in junior researchers to become experts in evidence synthesis? 
I think, you know, like I said, that Alex's infectious enthusiasm, it was like, I mean, I was like, I've just got to work with this man because, I mean, it, it was just infectious. And I think if we're passionate about what we do, then it's easy enough to inspire people. And we give people opportunities as well to don't hog the limelight. I remember um, John was in the, in the Revman advisory group. Mike Clark was chairing that group in, in Oxford at the time, and John couldn't go. And I went to that meeting, um, I don't know what I said or did, and John got feedback to say that, oh, I'd done well in the meeting. And then John said, okay, from now on, you go to all the meetings, and, and he backed off. So I think it's that thing to where don't hog the limelight. You know, when junior people start to come up, you think, okay, it's now time, <coughs> let go of the reins, let them fly, and then they again will inspire the next generation. Um. There is another question that I'm assuming that's going to be the last, but it's actually quite inspirational and we really want to hear from you on that, Yemizi. Where do you see Cochrane in five or ten years' time? Ooh, that's a hard one and I wish I could answer that. Um, where do I see Cochrane in five to ten years' time? I see Cochrane continuing to do what it does best of producing trusted evidence that people can go to the library when they, they want to find out what they need to know, whether they're a, a consumer or a, a decision maker, and that that evidence is in the right format for them. They don't have to read 500 pages to get to the nitty gritty of what they need to know. And that, again, we're able to respond in a timely way to produce the evidence. And we saw that during the pandemic. Granted, we all put down whatever we were doing to be able to work in a collaborative way, work quickly to be able to deliver those products so that um, governments and um, the WHO could um, make recommendations and so on. But I think it's that thing of just focusing on what we do best and perhaps, again, maybe not trying to do too much, because I find that when you're distracted, then you end up not even doing the basics very well. So I, I think that would be my not so wise response to that. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say that there is a message on the app from Catherine Spencer, reminding us that uh, there is a piece of work being uh, planned about the values, but that we have the principles. And that's what, what uh, I think that we also have, uh, that they are on the website. Um, YMZ, thank you. thank you. We know each other for quite some time. I've learned a lot from you and from Likewise. John and from others. I think uh, your, the way you, you interact with the, the younger generation, uh, not that I'm younger, but you know. <laughs> it's, it's all in the mind. It's fascinating. It's really good to see you. T I've, I've had the opportunity to see you uh, mentoring and teaching other people. Uh, you've put to us some important challenges. Uh, rest assured that we are listening. Uh, we are in a moment that is for the organization that is challenging. Uh, we've lost many of our close colleagues as a result of, a, of a stopping funds in certain areas. But uh, the most important thing for many of us is that we remain enthusiastic and collaborating. And I very much like there was no specific comment, and I think it's because everybody agrees that the, the base of your pillars is collaboration. Absolutely. So thank you very yeah. much. And uh, thank you for taking this challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to pass to Jordi. And I hope he wants the fan. I think Jordi would want this fan with him. Yeah, particularly as he's got jackets as well. Do you need that? Oops. Now I really love you, you miss you now. Okay, so, uh, are you ready for this? Okay, so now we are in one of my favorite moments of the colloquium, that uh, we have a few more awards, and they are absolutely fantastic because they help us to celebrate the community and to highlight the wonderful things that are happening around us in the community. And to start, 
uh, we're going to start with one of my favorite ones. So, and for that reason, I would like to invite uh, Rachel Klabunde to the stage to present the Bill Silverman Prize. Thanks, George. Thanks, Jordy. Hello, everyone. Um, so, the Bill Silverman Prize is offered annually, um, and explicitly acknowledges Cochrane's value of criticism. Um, this is with a view to helping to improve its work and achieve our aims of helping people make well-informed decisions about healthcare by providing the best possible evidence on the effects of healthcare interventions. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce that the 2023 winner of the Bill Silverman Prize is Dr. Yonggang Zhang. Uh, for his paper, co-publication improved the dissemination of Cochrane reviews and benefited co-publishing journals, a retrospective cohort study. Uh, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, Yang Gang was not able to make it, but I understand that he has a sent a video. I'm Yong Gang Zhang from West China Hospital of Sichuan University in China. Together with my co-authors, Mike Clark, Xiaoyang Liao, Lin Lin Zhu, we are delighted to have been awarded the 2023 Bill Slavery Prize. Co-publication of current reviews in general is sometimes pursued with the aim of achieving the wideness of possible dissemination and the impact of review findings and many current reviews have been co-published in general. However, whether co-publication will help the current or general is still needed to access. Thus, we perform our study. Our results found that the co-published reviews was associated with a higher citation friction and might increase the impact factor for general. This promotes the application of current evidence. We are proud to be the winner of the Bill Slavery Press. We hope this will help raise awareness of the relevance of co-publication of Cochrane reviews. Thank you, the Bill Slavery Press Committee. Thank you, Cochrane. Hey, and thank you, uh, Yongan, and thank you, Rochelle, uh, for presenting. And, oops. Okay, and now I would like to invite Ian Saldana. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here as uh, one of the two co-chairs of the Thomas Chalmers Awards Committee, Matt Page from Monash University, and I are co-chairs. So he might have to leave early from the meeting. So Thomas Chalmers, uh, who lived uh, between 1917 and 1955, he was an outspoken advocate of randomized trials. His creativity spanned his entire career, influencing clinicians and methodologists alike. He's perhaps best known for the notion of randomize the first patient, his belief that it is more ethical to randomize patients than to treat them in the absence of good evidence. So the awards that I will be announcing are for the principal authors, the presenting authors of the best long oral, the best short oral, and the best poster presentations at the meeting. Um, and these were presentations by uh, early career investigators, and they all address methodological issues relevant to systematic reviews. So the criteria that the committee used was originality of thought, high quality science, relevance to the advancement of the science of systematic reviews, and clarity of presentation. Now, it, there were a lot of pres, uh, abstracts that were potentially eligible for the Thomas Chalmers Award this year. We started with 95. Um, we reviewed a lot of them online, and then these folks listed here, the other committee members reviewed things online, many of them in person. They were bouncing around between sessions, so many thanks to the individuals who served as committee members for the award. So one announcement is that new this year is that the journal, the new journal Cochrane Evidence Synthesis and Methods will waive the article processing charges or publishing charges for three manuscripts that describe work presented in the three award-winning presentations. So that's good news. Um, so we'll start with the Thomas Chalmers Award for the best poster this year. And it's presented to May Silvera Bianchi. 
Uh, May is at Bangor University here in the UK, and the title of the poster was Co-Producing -produ with Children and Young People on a Meta-Ethnography on Experiences of Chronic Pain, Treatment, and Services. So congratulations, May. <laughs> is May here? Nope, doesn't seem like May's here, but we'll make sure to present the award, uh, make sure she, uh, May gets the certificate. All right, so uh, moving on to the Oral Presentations Awards. Uh, Thomas Chalmers Award for Best Short Oral Presentation. This goes to Lynn Hendricks from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. <laughs> is Lynn here? Oh, Lynn is here, great. So um, the, the presentation title was The Power of Storyboarding as an analytical tool in qualitative evidence synthesis, from review to fieldwork to dissemination. Congratulations, Lynn. Come on up. Yep. And finally, the last award is the Thomas Chalmers Award for the best long oral presentation. And this one goes to Peter Godolphin. Peter's at the University College in London. And Peter's presentation was on reliably estimating interactions and subgroup effects in aggregate data meta-analysis. Congratulations, Peter. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ian, and congratulations to all the awardees. Uh, and now, uh, as we're still on this uh, celebratory uh, mode of our community, I think it's uh, opportune now to, uh, to express our gratitude, as John Morrison expressed extremely eloquently at the AGM, to all the colleagues from the UK that uh, unfortunately lose their jobs because of the cut of fundings. I think because of all the strong efforts that they make, we can be here uh, with the success that we have. And I would like, please, a round of applause for our colleagues on the UK. <laughs> well, we are uh, getting to the end. And uh, I hope you all had fun during these last few days. I certainly, I have had. Uh, but everything ran extremely smoothly, and that seems that then it's an easy task to do, and so on, but it is not. Uh, now I'm going to spend uh, a bit of time to uh, thank all the people who have been uh, involved in the colloquium. And I would like to start with the scientific advisory board that provided advice to the working committees and teams on the scientific content of the program, please. You're going to get tired, you will see. Uh, the content curation